His Excellency, Honorable Uhuru Kenyatta, President of the Republic of Kenya, Cabinet Secretary for Education, Professor George Magoha, other Cabinet Secretaries present, Principal Secretary, Chairpersons, Chief Executive Officers, Vice Chancellors of Universities, Parents, Guardians, Distinguished Teachers, Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. I'm honored to have been invited here today. About a year ago, I attended a conference here, and I had a wonderful opportunity of being a group picture with the president, but I was very far away from him. And now, I'm, I'm so fortunate that I'm sitting so close to him. <laughs> so, those are things that happen in one's lives, right? Yeah, things can change. <laughs> I'm very honored and excited to be in Kenya. Kenya is leading the way in education reform. And I tell you one thing, I was not invited here because I'm the Deputy Minister for Education in Ghana. I was invited here because I have many years of experience in education reform in America, where I taught for 10 years and built schools there, charter schools in Los Angeles. And when the president of Ghana, <clears throat> at the time he was a candidate, came to California, visited one of my schools, he was amazed that a Ghanaian could go to America and build schools there. At that time, about 200 workers who were working for me. And he asked me, would you consider coming back to Ghana to help me change the education system? And the response was, yes, I will consider. But it was not easy. I grew up very poor in Ghana, and I was in America having the American dream. 200 workers working for me. <laughs> a black man in America. And <laughs> Uh, it was a good life. Then somebody is saying, come. So I met with a mentor of mine who happens to be a former congressman. And I asked him, should I go to Ghana? Should I stay in America? And he said, yeah, well, I'll tell you one thing. You've done fantastically well in America, but America can do without you. But, but, but maybe your country cannot do without you. He spoke to my heart. I was ready to come. I went home and told my wife, we are going back to Ghana. He said, going back to Ghana after 26 years. Are you serious? Yes, we are going. And long story short, I found myself in Ghana. I ran for parliament, elected, and the president asked me to be a deputy minister for education. The president had a vision in Ghana to transform the education system, and that is why he asked me to come. He said high school should be free, and people were saying, how? It's impossible. He said it was possible. He handed the responsibility to us. The reason I'm bringing this up is this. When you have a determined president, everything is possible. Yeah. And that is why when I look at the curriculum framework and the work that you are doing, I was excited to have been invited. You see, in education, there are three things that you have to do in order to transform it and make education relevant to the fortunes of your country. You have to look at access. You have to look at the quality of the education system, and you have to look at relevance of the education system. Every aspect of this is being tackled this, in this country, just like we are doing in Ghana. So when my president began the free senior high school, and people said it was not going to be possible, they, they were right when they said, you don't have the buildings. But because he was determined, we had to borrow from America and, and got a strategy that enabled us in one year to increase enrollment by 150,000 without building a new school block. <laughs> and that is what a determined president allowed you to do. The political risk was huge, but he said, go ahead with your knowledge, support your minister, get it done. And we got it done. And we introduced a double track system in Ghana. And as I said, go 150,000 students to go to school. Then we have to look at curricular reform just like you are doing. It seems like Ghana and Kenya are twins, and um, I've, I've come here to realize that most of the things you are doing, we're also doing. And, and as I talk about access, you've done fantastically well. I look at your numbers, it's amazing. Then you are looking at quality through the reform of your curriculum. You see, the old days where the teacher expected you to just memorize facts to him or her, and you are the best student, it doesn't pertain anymore. If you do that, you are not going to change your country. Yeah, they will memorize it to you, but they walk into that company and the CEO is not expecting them to memorize and they fumble. 
The Brookings Institution recently did a study and they said that we, the developing countries, if we had to catch up with the rest of the world, the developed nation, it's going to take 120 years. And they recommended that the countries that are going to do well are not the ones who are going to wait till they finish assess and look at quality and then relevance. They said the countries that are going to do well are the ones that will tackle the issues of assets, quality, and relevance at the same time. And that is what they call <laughs> leapfrogging inequality. You can look at the book, leapfrogging inequality. Kenya is on the right track to leapfrog inequality. And based on what I've seen and what you are doing, it's not going to take you 120 years. It's going to take you shorter than that. The Asian tigers that we talk about, it didn't take them that long because they did everything concurrently. In South Korea, at the time of independence, Ghana had more money than them, and probably Kenya also had more money than them. How did they do better than us? They did it concurrently. As the economy was improving, they were investing heavily in education. And out of that, they were able to catch up with developed nations. Our GDP in Ghana, gross domestic per capita, was higher than South Korea. Recently, South Koreans came to Ghana with a group of investors, their the SM Bank, and they were going to give Ghana a loan. They showed us three graphs at the Ministry of Education. The first graph was the GDP of Ghana per capita compared with that of South Korea in 1960. Ghana was way ahead of them. They showed us the second graph, uh, which actually looked at where we are now. Per capita income of Ghana and South Korea, and of course, they are way ahead of us. And they asked us the question. I was the chair of the meeting. They said, why do you guys think we are not better than you? And of course, I was scratching my head in shame. Somebody comes to your country and asks you, why am I better than you? <laughs> and then they showed us the final graph. The final graph was a gross tertiary enrollment ratio of South Korea and Ghana compared. That is, if you take the youth between 18 to 23, how many of them are in some kind of tertiary education, whether it's nursing, teaching, any other thing at the tertiary level? Ghana was 16.19%, and South Korea is 936 So they said, this is why we are here to give you a loan so that you can build a university. <laughs> and I promised myself that the next 60 years, I don't want my grandson to sit in a meeting like that. I want to tell you one thing. I landed at the airport and I saw the airplanes and beautiful ones. We don't have a national airline. You guys do. And you say it's the pride of Africa. And you truly you are the pride of Africa. Because it really made me proud to see that another African country has all these airlines. But also what occurred to me was that if I look at the example of Brazil, the Embraer aircraft. It was a university that partnered with MIT and invented it. So my challenge, and I met with my colleague, the Secretary for Education, I said, Mr. Secretary for Education, when can we create aerospace academies for students in primary one all the way to high school? Because that is what is done in America. When I was building schools, we are not waiting for the students to get to the university for them to understand aeronautical sciences. There are schools from KG to high school focused on aeronautical sciences, tapping talents of students who are interested in this world across the country. And when we do that in Kenya, you will just not fly airlines, but you are going to have children who will be excited about transforming this country to do, uh, through the aerospace industry, and your children are going to build the airplanes that you'll be flying. And I tell you, I know what I'm talking about because in America, it will take me about 50% of my effort in the classroom as a mathematics teacher to get the student to pay attention to me. I go to Ghana, I walk into the classroom, the student will stand up for me, and they will uh, not sit until I tell them to sit. The children of Africa are ready to learn. And if we don't get them to be the best in the world, it's not their fault, it's our fault. And that is why I want all stakeholders to rally behind your great president. His vision is clear, and I'm not saying it as a politician, I'm saying it as an education expert, as someone who has a PhD in education policy and administration from the University of Southern California, and somebody who had built schools in the U.S., that there's something great about what we have embarked upon. There will be challenges. 
but don't allow the challenges to stop the vision. I know the time is limited, but I'll tell you one story. When we started Free Senior High School in Ghana, and we started with a double track, and the president promised Ghanaians that five to seven years I will eliminate it. You see, when the president speaks, it's a law unto us. So we had to go and say, how are you going to do it? And then we got an innovative idea which says we have a dedicated source of funding from the government through taxes for school infrastructure development. So why don't we project what the revenue will give us in 10 years' time and look at what the Americans do when they are building schools. When a city in America is building schools, they don't wait for the money to trickle in every year. They borrow against a dedicated source of funding, use that to build their schools today, and then wait and pay it down. So we look at the source of funding for education, for school infrastructure, and we realize that if we borrow 40% of the revenue that will come to us in 10 years' time, it will give us $1.5 billion, and we did it. So if $1.5 billion wouldn't have come from the World Bank, they wouldn't have given it to us. But that money was sitting in Ghana, and when the president was fiercely determined that he needed to do something, all of a sudden ideas came and were able to generate $1.5 billion in Ghana. And as I speak with you, we are building schools everywhere. And those ideas that happened because the president was fearless, he was determined, he was willing to do the impossible, and we supported him. When you support your president, who is determined to transform the fortunes of this country, in the 21st century, our transformation is not going to be about the fact that we have coffee or cocoa. It's going to be about the fact that we have created creative minds around the country. For those of you who are not in education, I don't want to bore you with education jargons, but there's something called the Bloom's Taxonomy. And now we have the new Bloom's Taxonomy. The highest level of learning is when children create something, and not when they memorize facts. So when you look at the new Bloom's Taxonomy, uh, instead of telling the children in your classroom to talk about the effects of pollution and what causes pollution. Those are good at the basic level, pro comprehension level. But you want your kids to be the best in the world, you are going to ask them to create a city without pollution. And that is where the ideas will come to the front. That is where great ideas will come. And that is what your curricular promises. And I want to be able to come back here maybe 20 years time and see your aerospace high school and where children are actually designing something unique and profound. Because if you wait till the university for them to know aerospace, you are late. <laughs> Other countries are not doing. This curriculum promises you that. I'm excited to be here and also to tell your president and your nation that Ghana is ready to partner. And the future of Africa, the story of Africa will be different when we come together and partner together and work together and know that Africa's fortunes lies within us. And there are things that we can do, of course, with support from our friends from other nations, but the future of Africa depends on us and is going to take bold leadership of African president and other leaders to turn the fortunes of Africa around so that the story of Africa, when it's written, some of us will find our names in the appendices. I went to UK, visited the uh, UK, and went to the, the parliament, and I saw statues everywhere. And there was a colleague of mine who was right behind me. And I turned around and I told him, I said, I'd rather be African. And he said, why do you say you'd rather be African when you're in the parliament of UK? And I said, in Africa, I don't see that many statues. So if I work hard enough, in my village, there'll be a statue erected in my honor. <laughs> so when all of us work together and work hard together, it's not just going to be the story of our illustrious our president. It's also going to be that under his tenure, under his watch, all of us came together, forgot about our differences, and put the Kenyan child in the center of our focus and our target. And we did everything possible to transform Kenya. And that is what the story should be. And that is what the history should be. God bless you. God bless Kenya. God bless Ghana.